Dear members and friends of the Whitewater Congregational United Church of Christ, welcome to our December 20th pre-recorded service. The link to this week's service video and contact information for pastoral care are included in this email. Additionally, the service video is available on Fairhaven Channel, Facebook, and Whitewater Channel 990. The Community Campus Meals served 51 meals this past Monday. Please consider joining our team. With the incoming winter, they are losing a couple of volunteers until April. On Mondays from 4.30 to 6 p.m., they set up and hand out the prepared meals. Five volunteers keep the distribution moving smoothly. On one day of the weekend, volunteers gather to assemble the meals and the process moves quickly with four people. At this time, they plan to continue serving spaghetti meals every Monday. Their next scheduled Monday off is Memorial Day. If you are able and interested in volunteering, please contact Margie Hamrell or Renee. Your help will be greatly appreciated. If you haven't returned your pledge commitment to the office yet, you can still drop it in the mail. Financial support of the church is needed now as we prepare the 2021 budget. Boards and officers are reminded to submit their annual report to the office. We are still seeking support toward the special offering for the Christmas fund. This fund provides direct financial support to those clergy, lay employees, and surviving spouses who serve the church and are facing financial difficulties. You can mail your gift to the office. Please continue to pray for Wilfred Rowe. With his input, he returned to Fairhaven and is on hospice care there after his challenging battle with COVID-19. Judy Trebold is still suffering with COVID-19. She, along with the Rowe and Trebold families, need your prayers. Please keep Dan Winger and his family in your prayers. His body has responded very favorably to the antibiotics, and he is expected to have a full recovery. Please keep Linda Norton in your prayers as she deals with the death of her son, Chad Rovers, in a car accident. Everyone should have received notice that the sanctuary will be open Christmas Eve from noon until 6 p.m. for families and individuals to spend a brief time in our church home. You need to contact Renee at the office, 262-473-4101, by 9 a.m. on December 23rd to schedule your time slot. If you are in need of pastoral care, please contact Pastor Dave McDonald at the number and email provided here. Well, Merry Christmas to you and to yours. Good morning, this is worship for the 20th of December. I'm David McDonald. This is the Congregational United Church of Christ in Whitewater, Wisconsin. We're glad you're joining us, whether it's at Fairhaven, whether it is here in the city uh, on cable channel 990, or some of our internet friends who are watching on YouTube or through the Facebook link. We're, we're glad you're here. This is uh, going to be a busy week for everybody. <clears throat> Even with the uh, unusual circumstances we live in, I know that lots of us have things that we still need to get done this week. So do it with distinction and with care, please. Uh, we're inviting folks uh, who are able to come into the sanctuary uh, who would like to do so on Christmas Eve. We've got some sign-ups in the church office. They are 20-minute blocks, beginning in the early afternoon, running through 6 o'clock. They will be scheduled on the hour and the half hour, and you'll have a 20-minute block where if you would like to come into the sanctuary, the, the room is decorated. We've got the Christmas tree up, the Advent wreath. We'll have all those things in place and ready to go. Uh, we'll have some uh, Christmas uh, music being played uh, on the CD in the background. It is not church, and I understand that, but I know for some of you it would feel nice to be able to come home and be in this space once again. When you do so, you sign up in the church office and let us know that you're coming. Uh, there'll be as many as six pews occupied, if you will. That is to say, uh, you may not have the room exclusively to yourself, there's, we feel enough space and enough distance between people that we can move people around to have their quiet time uh, in the room. But you'll come in through the west corner door and you'll leave through the center doors and then go back out through the archway uh, door to the, to the uh, church door and, and your cars. And that'll give us enough time to come back in the room and, and uh, touch up the surfaces and make sure that the room is uh, attended to and will allow people who are coming in not to be in the faces of those who are going out. We want to make sure we don't have any more crossover than we need to. So please, when you sign up for a time, don't come terribly early. 
and expect to come into the building, like your doctor's office, like, uh, like the bank. Uh, you need to wait outside until you're assigned time. That's why they're, you have a half an hour slot that you're only going to be here essentially for 20 minutes. That gives us time to move people in and out of the room and make sure that the room remains a relatively safe area. So uh, we're hopeful you can join us. We understand if you cannot, there is no problem if you can't come, but we wanted to make some, um, some kind of access and some kind of acknowledgement that it is in fact Christmas Eve and most of our folks have not been in the building in the last nine months. And we think that this will be a way to allow that to happen both responsibly and faithfully. Again, if you'd like to be here, please call the office. Please make those signups by 9 o'clock on Wednesday morning, the 23rd of December, so we can make those arrangements properly. And I know how the schedule is going to work. I will be in the building making sure that things are happening so Renee and others don't have to be here. But uh, uh, I, I, I need to know the schedule because I'm going to want to get back, back to Madison uh, at that evening. So please let us know that you're coming. Also, we are continuing to receive offerings on behalf of the Christmas Fund, formerly known as the Veterans of the Cross Fund. Those gifts will be forwarded to the conference and on to the National Church uh, in, in several weeks. That fund, if you have not been paying attention, is the Emergency uh, Relief Fund available for uh, pastors and ministers and church servants in need. Uh, they have had, I believe, the last I heard, uh, it's a staggering number of requests this year that has drawn upon those resources and we would like to replenish the fund to the extent that it is possible. So if you've not yet done so, please do take a moment and send us a gift to, to the church office marked for the Christmas fund and we will make sure it gets forwarded on and we thank you for that. Following along with the worship materials that the members of the church will have received via email from Pat O'Connor, would you please join me in this morning's call to worship? We're going to Bethlehem to ponder the, prof, the promise of the prophet. We're going to Bethlehem to sing the carol of the angels. We're going to Bethlehem to greet the savior of the world. Come and worship, worship Christ, the newborn king. And our invocation. Oh God, never ready to meet our demands but ever ready to hear our pleas. Prepare us for the scandal that is your advent. Deliver us from the pride of the powerful and mighty. Move us to recall your humility in coming among us. Help us remember, as we prepare for your coming, that we yield not to adore the Lord of the manor, but to celebrate the Lord of the manger. Amen. The first hymn this morning for the, for the fourth Sunday in Advent is Once in Royal David City. The words are printed in the worship materials. If you have an old Presbyterian worship book, it's number 539. You'll find it in many hymns. Sing along as you will at home. i 
bulletins, would you join me please at the top of page two for the prayer of confession. Let us pray. O oh God, we confess it is not easy to wake. Our world worships power, which moves quickly through force and determination. How difficult it is for us to wait. We admit that waiting for your power, which comes to us through love, is a challenge. The world distracts us with lights and sounds that assault the quiet nature of your coming, and we admit to being dazzled by this. We fail to do what you desire, bringing forth the reign of justice. We repent of these sinful, selfish ways, accept our humble hearts as an offering to bring the Christ child closer, sooner into our lives and world, for Christ is needed now more than ever by us and by a broken world. Amen. With all the waiting that has entailed the year 2020, we wait still this one more week for the gift of the Christ child. But the gifts that the child brings have already been given. Frankly, our redemption and access to the gifts and graces and mercies of our God and Savior have always been here for us. There is no need to wait, for we are forgiven and free. In that spirit, then, go out and share those gifts with others, that they might know that the world and we are redeemed by the gift of the child whom we celebrate, especially this week, to whom be all the glory. Amen. Wherever you are, know that you are wanted in this space and wanted by your friends and your neighbors among us. In this season especially, when we are so accustomed to being able to share and visit and see people as we have not seen them recently, it's that much more difficult to wait. But hope comes, joy comes, peace comes, and this week the gift of love is ours. Go forth into the world and sin no more. We'll join together in singing the Gloria from Angels We Have Heard on High, please. for this morning is from the Hebrew Scriptures. It's in the text of Psalm 89, verses 1 through 4, uh, and verses 19 to 26. Hear these words from Scripture. I will sting of your, sing of your steadfast love, O Lord, forever. With my mouth I will proclaim your faithfulness to all generations. I declare that your steadfast love is established forever. Your faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. You said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to my servant, David. I will establish your descendants forever and build your throne for all generations. Then you spoke in a vision to your faithful one and said, I have set the crown on one who is mighty. I have exalted one chosen from the people. I have found my servant David with my holy oil. I have anointed him. My hand shall always remain with him. My arm also shall strengthen him. 
The enemy shall not outwit him, and the wicked shall not humble him. I will crush his foes before him and strike down those who hate him. My faithfulness and steadfast love shall be with him, and in my name his horn shall be exalted. I will set his hand on the sea and his right hand on the rivers. He shall cry to me, You are my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. The scripture reading today is from Romans 16, chapters 25 through 27. Now to God, who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but is now disclosed, and through the prophetic writings is made known to all the Gentiles, according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever. Amen. The gospel lesson appointed for this Sunday comes from Luke's first chapter, beginning at verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house and lineage of David, and the woman's name was Mary. The angel came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But Mary was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. Gabriel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son. You shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his forebear David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom shall have no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, and therefore the child to be born will be holy, and will be called the Son of God. And now your kinswoman Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month for her, who was said to be barren, for nothing is impossible with God. And then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel Gabriel departed from her. This is the gospel and the promise of our coming Savior, Jesus Christ. The words are true and they can be believed. Join me, please, in singing our next hymn. It's number uh, 471 from the Presbyterian Worship Book, Love Divine, All Loves Excel. You'll recognize the tune.
Let me cover a little background with this, uh, with this section from Luke's Gospel. The kinswoman Elizabeth to whom uh, Gabriel refers is, as you may recall, the mother of John the Baptizer. So just understand that when we go about this business of declaring and heralding the coming one, we're also engaging in the family business. Elizabeth and Mary were cousins. Joseph, uh, uh, Jesus and um, John were, were cousins as well. So you might say that this whole prophecy thing has got a, a, a bit of a lineage thing. Now, keep in mind, however, that John the Baptizer and Elizabeth are not of the house and lineage of David. They are Mary's kinsfolk. So uh, Jesus is getting a little bit of prophetic voice and wisdom, not only from his uh, claimed lineage from the house of David through Joseph, but also through his mother's side. Mary is often treated in these narratives as if she were, um, because she is a young girl, that must of necessity make her unaware. I've always been frankly upset with this question from Gabriel. You know, do you know what's gonna happen to you girl is essentially the meaning behind the question. And while she may not know what is going to happen, it certainly makes no sense that a virgin is gonna have a child. Even today, it doesn't make a sense that a virgin is gonna have a child, but that is what it is on the basis of faith. And this story recounts how that is to be. An angel Gabriel tells her that the spirit of the Most High will come upon thee and you will be known and you will conceive a child who shall be called Jesus. And Mary responds in kind and says, I am ready, Lord, I am yours. She takes on this accountability and this responsibility. Some would argue that how can a teenage girl know what she's getting in for? You can make that argument all you want. It, given the circumstances in which she finds herself, she really doesn't have much choice. Anyone who has found themselves expecting a child unexpectedly, particularly as a young person, knows that there's not a whole lot that can be done except to hope and pray that the instincts that we have implanted within us take over and we have learned enough through observation to know what to do in order to parent a child. I was in my mid-20s when our first our daughter was born, and I think back on those years and how when I look at my own children who are now older than I was then, and I realize how young they are and how young I must have been by extension, I'm amazed that God did not issue me a handbook of instructions, but there was none. There was, frankly, only the the learning that comes from observing other parents and other people in your family and amongst the neighbors and how to deal with a child. You know they scream and squawk a lot and they produce volumes of liquids and semi-solids from various parts of their body at different points that you know as a young person you are never ever going to touch. And then like Mary you find yourself with but no choice. And you find yourself hoping you've got the right kind of cloth and wet kind of smelling device nearby to take care of whichever end and whatever substance it is. Mary knew what she was in for. The angel Gabriel comes and offers the explanation of the ages and we all understand that we of the church have acclaimed and proclaimed this good news. But on a very micro level, on a very personal level, what Mary was dealing with was a baby she hadn't planned for showing up too early. And once she knew what was happening to her, she knew she was going to have to adapt. And in the midst of all of the confusion that surrounds us in those times, even under the best of circumstances, we can admit to being overwhelmed. I remember when we were expecting again Julia, and we were about... It was probably, well, it was Christmas time, and Julia was born in February, and I remember looking at Janet and looking at her and thinking, what have we done? And then I remembered that for countless generations of people gone before me, we had done exactly what everyone else had done, and that the love that we shared was going to bring forth this new life, whatever that would mean for us whatever it would mean for that child. 
all of us, when we are faced with that consideration and step back and realize that this is a gift of love, an overwhelming gift of love that requires attention and affection and will take far more out of us physically and emotionally than we think will be necessary. And yet we do it. I was chatting just this morning with a friend of my son's who lives in India. Jishnu and Cullen were roommates in the last semester Cullen spent in Beloit. And Jishnu and I were talking about his new girlfriend, who is actually Roman Catholic. He's Hindu and she's Catholic in India. And they were, they're beginning to have those feel-out conversations around whether or not this might be a lifelong relationship or not. That being said, he asked when we talked a little bit about where we were with parenting and when we had our children and where that was with graduate school and where that was with serving the church and where that was with Janet's education, he, he kind of chuckled as he will do and he said, how did you do it? I said, I honestly don't know how we did it. And I look back on those times and I think we were so terribly young. And what occurs to me, or occurs to me retrospectively at least, is that you do it because you have to. And you don't have time to decide what you're going to do because the circumstances force you to make choices. Any eldest child will tell you that they got the worst end of everything because they were the eldest. The parents didn't know what they were doing and so they learned on them. And I retort as a youngest that they waited until the last one, me, when they realized they had reached their perfection moment in parenting and they didn't need any more. All that is a silly way of suggesting that Mary, who understood what was happening to her, probably knew intuitively, based on what she knew of her faith, that God was going to be with her throughout this all. And everything that she knew, everything that she would learn, everything that she would come to realize in her role as a mother, was going to come with a guarantee and a blessing from God. And those blessings, you know, continue throughout life. They don't just happen when the baby is born. And they're not just for the newborn and the newborn's new mother. But the blessings of life come to us all throughout our lives. We engage in the gift of self-pity when we forget those blessings. When we feel as though what we have done and how we have lived has not been enough and those around us do not appreciate who we have been and what we have been. Take a step back and think about what that entails. What does it mean for us to appreciate what God does for us and to know that we are amongst God's beloved? What does it mean for a people of faith to dare to understand that the love of the divine, God's love, is more than enough for us in any given moment? I was talking with some friends about how they were doing a Zoom chat between friends. We were talking about who was going to do what or how people were going to do what for the holiday season this coming week. Some of them have had long-standing customs of visiting their mother-in-law. The, the mother-in-law is the matriarch, and they go off to her home, and they and their siblings and their siblings-in-law and whichever of the grandchildren are around go, and they basically do homage to grandmama. There'll be no homage this year because four of the five children involved have said they are not going to go. And she's dreadfully hurt. She has pulled out every guilt-inducing trick that a mother learns over the course of a lifetime, and she has wielded them with vigor and with might. She has complained that they don't love her, that their spouses, respectively, have poisoned them against her, and that they, in turn, have poisoned the grandchildren from having to go visit their grandmother on Christmas Day. My friend was asking for what could he say? How could he respond? I didn't have any real good advice. Frankly, as a pastor, Christmas is exhausting. We don't have company on Christmas because invariably between Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, I've had pastoral responsibilities. This is the first year in all the years I have been preaching where I don't have accountabilities or responsibilities in the same usual way. 
but we still can't have anybody over. All that being said, I finally said to him, look, what we're really dealing with is the fact that things are changing. And your mother-in-law doesn't like change. None of us likes the changes that happen to us. And we especially don't like being out of control when change happens. You know, we're often told in leadership classes and institutes and webinars and things of this sort that you should be an agent of change in the world for the good. It's one of the mantras that someone with a master's degree must have gotten paid handsomely for and sold it on a trademark basis to some institute of training. Be the agent of change in the world around you. That's a wonderful and lofty thought. And it's frankly comforting because you are in the business of engaging in change. But the change you're directing is your choosing. It's the change that you want, delivered and implemented in the ways that you want. Newsflash, that's not the only change that happens in this life. And all of calendar 2020 has been a rip-roaring example of the fact that the change that comes is not controlled by us, no matter how much we wish it were so, no matter how much our voices arguing against it act to induce us to do things that will prevent or reverse the change. I cannot restore 307,000 lives. I cannot bring back from the dead those who have gone. None of our caregivers, none of our nurses, none of our friends who are acting as CNAs can change or alleviate the suffering of those who have suffered so much. This isn't the kind of change we invite, but this is the kind of change that happens. It's exhausting, it's overwhelming, it's annoying, it's all of the attributes you want to assign to it that are not happy or pleasant, all at once. But, and this is a pretty big but, but we see in the midst of these ravishing numbers and the ravishing that has happened in families both near and far, that God really is still present. And that does not the ways we perceive it, the ways we understand it, and the ways in which we value it may in fact change and probably do and probably should because that kind of change also signals growth. It is when we continue to hope against hope, when we continue to say things are as they should be because we said so that we continue to delude ourselves into believing we can, by our own sheer hard-headedness and will, make the world bend to our own choices. Obviously, that's not a moment where my friend was going to be able to tell his mother-in-law what I had said. Finally, I just said, look, point out to her that even things have changed. That there was a time when she was not the matriarch on the throne to whom all of the children, grandchildren, sons and daughters-in-law came to do homage on Christmas Day. That in fact she had not taken that function over until she was in her early 50s when her mother-in-law went into the nursing home. And while these intervening years have made it possible for her to be the one who has held the brood together, maybe it's time that the brood be freed to try something else give somebody else a chance. I have a clue whether he has taken that advice, nor whether he has bothered to say anything to his mother-in-law, but he did kind of look at me and he said, what you're telling me, Dave, is to tell her she's old. I said, well, I wouldn't put it quite like that. But you know, you and I are of a certain age ourselves. 
older than she was when she took over the family partners. Maybe that will be an indicator to her that it might be okay that she not spend two and a half weeks trying to get the house ready when she's too hard-headed to have her knee replaced and her knee hurts and her shoulder aches and she really can't push around that vacuum that is too good to throw away because the motor still runs but it weighs 900 pounds. Maybe the change isn't such a bad thing. And maybe in the midst of change, she can let the children, the grandchildren, and now the great-grandchildren begin to express for her their love in different ways that have more meaning for them. This is the theme of the day, you know. The fourth Sunday of Advent is the Advent candle of love. Maybe it's possible for us to see, as Mary did, that while things were changing, that the expressions of love that come to us are more genuine and meaningful when we let others express their love in their own way as opposed to expecting their expressions of devotion to fit some sort of fealty oath that we have dreamed up for ourselves. That just perhaps it's possible for people to see, to believe, and to acknowledge the love that is given and shared as a blessing when we let others do so in their own ways, whether it be spoken or written, whether it be in some form of art, whether it be a silent look that speaks volumes. The gifts of love are real, even and especially in its change. Yeah, they're not what we want, maybe. But we can know this, that when a gift of love is given, it really can change our world for the better, and even in ways that are unexpected. The unexpected change comes. The world is ready for God's gift of love and peace and hope and joy to be with us yet once again. The waiting is near over, but the change is already here. To the glory of God. Amen. God of love and majesty, we come before you this morning, remembering and recognizing your hand at work in our lives and amongst those whom we know and love. We acknowledge that you invite us to ex expect and anticipate changes that come, and you ask us not to resent or to resist the good changes which you intend, but that we might be ready for the changes that come, not knowing what form they will take, but to rely upon you in those moments of fear that inevitably precede the changes that we begin to encounter. Help us, Lord, to know that we are with you when our world feels shaken and shattered and to accept the gifts that you give us that invite us to change, to adapt, and to finally grow in new and different ways, even when we feel old and forgotten. For as long as your spirit is within us, we are capable of change and of growth. We invoke your Spirit's power on behalf of those who need you most, those who grieve over the death of a child, those who grieve over the death of a parent, those who grieve over the death of a beloved spouse and dear friend. For so many of us, these weeks have come and we look with caution in our newspapers and listen with care for word from family and friends about those over whom we are worried. Teach us, we pray, to leave go of our fear and anxiety, to rely upon you in confidence and hope that whatever may come, you are there, filling the voids that we perceive, upholding us and lifting us close, 
to feel your embrace, your love, and your spirit's power. Be with nurses and doctors, caregivers, CNAs, all those who are tending to the folks in care, whether in hospital or residential facility. We know these weeks and months have passed and they are boring and long. We know that there are those who wish they could be out and we pray that they will be and will be able to be soon. In the meantime, we pay for patience, patience and endurance and that those whose hands are overburdened with care for others may find in you the promised rest that comes for all who will rely upon you. Bless those planning weddings and marriages. Bless those whose family celebrations have been postponed, especially in this season. Bless those whose understandings of these events may be clouded. And help us find words to speak that will offer them hope as well as share our love. For those anticipating the gift of new life by birth or adoption, for those who are alone seemingly again at this holiday season, let your spirit be with them. And let us express for them the love and the care that we have for them, not just spoken in our minds and prayers, but be spoken or written or shared with them that they might know that they are not forgotten. Keep safe those who have gone to zones of war. Bring peace to last and reign upon the earth. Give hope to those who are in fear for their lives and their families. And let us all know that we are yours. Pray for the Universal Church, for the United Church of Christ, for the Wisconsin Conference, and the Southwest Association. For our friends Franz and Lorraine and the work that they do on our behalf. For the ministries of the churches here in Whitewater. Let us all be worthy of the trust that is in us as faithful servants to you. For the university and its students and faculty, the staff, keep them healthy and safe in this time away from our city. Welcome them back again healthy that we might go forward together. We pray for this, the Congregational United Church of Christ. For the folks who are a part of our family, who have been here through the years, whom you have reclaimed for your heavenly realm, and for the work that we do. We pray our actions would be faithful and hopeful, and that you would bless us all as we seek to follow where you will lead. Finally, using the words that our Savior has taught to us, we join our voices together to offer our family prayer. And say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. In this season of giving, we're grateful that you remember to give to this church and to other places where charitable work is conducted. I'm going to get crass. It's the end of the year. Some of you may want to be able to file a receipt from the church for your tax giving purposes. And I would remind you that the last receipts for calendar 2020 must be received by the by Tuesday, the 5th of January, 2021. After that date, those receipts and gifts will be recorded against your tax record for the next year. Crafts, commercialism, and tax planning aside, the gifts that you give make a difference to the work that we do, and we're grateful when you return them. 
Please do so by forwarding your gifts to the church at the Congregational United Church of Christ, 133 South Franklin Street, Whitewater, Wisconsin, 53190. Now join me please in singing our doxology. For the gifts that come, for the joy of life, for the presence of those who care for us as with your hands, we thank you and bless you, loving Creator. In response, we offer our gifts that they may be used to do your will, both here and elsewhere. Bless all who will receive of this bounty, that they may come to know your mercy and compassion throughout all the days of their lives. Amen. Our final hymn for this fourth Sunday in Advent is, I love to tell the story, it's in a hymnal called Worship and Rejoice, it's number 560. Please join along. Sing the 
I love to tell the story. Twill be my theme in glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. Go forth from wherever you might be knowing that the gift of the child Jesus comes to us this week and really does bring us hope and peace and joy and love, even though your gathering may be simpler than usual or maybe none at all. Know that the love of Christ is with you as we celebrate the birth of our Savior Jesus Christ. Go forth and know that God's love for you is real and that the grace and mercy of God, our Father and Creator, the fellowship and companionship of the Christ child and the communion of God's Holy Spirit goes between us and among us all until we gather again in Christ's name. Amen and Merry Christmas.